Tu as boyé du néon, n'a pas de bébé du néon. Bébé, il y a un problème. Hello, hello, hi, good morning. Are you doing okay? Yeah, good morning. I'll be on behind the scene. Sorry. I'll be on behind the scene. All right, okay. That's okay. fine. No worries. So right, just maybe you. if you're if you're on the phone or otherwise, just maybe keep it muted. And when you want to ask questions, you know, I'll uh, come back for it. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Okay. Then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining in this session today. So we are looking at continuing our journey on uh, the unit, which is uh, health and safety in health and social care, a bit of a mouthful, uh, with the health and safety um, in terms of health being repeated. But yeah, unit 4.25, uh, in which, uh, you know, we covered yesterday some of the important bits of legislation, some acts um, and other compliance related, uh, you know, policies, which mostly all, uh, you know, uh, let's say all players in the health and social care sector have to follow. So when I say players, I mean by that care homes, I mean the National Health Service, I mean, I also mean uh, centers or you know organizations which are involved in delivering care either in the community or under public private partnerships and this is where you know the the main idea was to try and understand what are the various legal requirements which have to be implemented from a point of view of health and safety uh, you know for any organization uh, when they are providing services or delivering integrated care you know within the sector so we covered learning outcome one yesterday, which had three assessment criteria. Excuse me. Yeah. And then today we are going to be looking at understanding, you know, how we can look at, uh, you know, implementing some of these policies uh, from a point of view of, um, uh, you know, from a point of view of, sorry about that, from a point of view of, you know, understanding how these can be implemented within the sector um, and when we look at delivering care, um, you know, specifically from a point of view of uh, delivering care to patients or as a social worker, as a care worker, delivering care to patients and um, essentially when they are in a particular location to, um, when I say location, what I mean by that is either a care home or a hospital, GP surgery, pharmacy, whatever they are, um, there are certain risks uh, which need to be assessed to ensure that a care plan which has been put forward, you know, works for them and there are no untoward hazards or risks which the patient or the person receiving the care is uh, prone to or is, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, is going to face. And that gives the confidence to the person to be able to say that, okay, yes, um, the care that they're going to receive or the you know procedure or the operative procedure that they're undergoing uh, you know is going to be a success and that gives them confidence to be able to you know take that forward 
So from our point of view, in the second learning outcome, we are going to be understanding how some of these risk assessments, which, which are coming out of the policies and procedures that we have studied in learning outcome one, are going to be put into practice. And why are these very important in the process of ensuring that if a social worker or if a health and social care worker, nurse, anybody who's working within the sector, doctor, GP, you know, pharmacist, uh, people in the community, if they are associated with delivering care, how do they create an integrated uh, plan? Or, or if I may say a word, care plan, and that the care plan essentially then ensures that you know the uh, delivery of the care which is going to be, or the service which is going to be delivered to the patient in this case, or the person who's receiving the care is confident that yes, all risks have been identified, all hazards have been uh, either mitigated or you know can um, uh, have been encountered, uh, and you know there are plans in place to make sure that. Uh, you know, nothing goes wrong. And this gives the patient or the person receiving the treatment confidence uh, uh, that they are going to be receiving the care, right quality of care for which they have come in uh, to seek that operation or that operative procedure. And it has, this learning outcome has four assessment criteria. So we're going to be looking at understanding what is information uh, that we can gather to look at assessing risk uh, from a point of view of organizational policies and procedures. Uh, in the second one uh, assessment criteria, we will look at what is the impact <clears throat> of these policies uh, when they are not implemented or when they are implemented uh, as per what is required to be done and how standards are maintained and how it uh, affects the care which the customers receive or the patients receive. In the third one, uh, we will be looking at dilemmas uh, which can be encountered while implementing some of these policies. Uh, specifically related to health and safety. So here we're going to be discussing one or two cases to look at uh, things like uh, data protection issues. Um, sometimes when you are poised uh, with providing information um, and this has to be shared, but you are also looking at person-centered approach and making sure that the information uh, being shared is not compromising the quality of care which the patient is receiving. So we look at some of those dilemmas which are uh, you know, related to the third assessment criteria when these policies and procedures are followed. And then we'll be looking at in the last one, how does this affect the care plan or essentially the patient care, uh, the, the, pay, the care the which patient is receiving when these policies and procedures are not implemented uh, as per the uh, guidance set by CQC or some of the compliance bodies within this sector. So this is, uh, I would say, um, again, a theoretical outcome, uh, outcome wherein we are primarily looking at understanding the ways in which health and safety requirements can impact the delivery of care to a customer or a patient in a particular setup. In terms of the integrated content, uh, this has been broken down into four. So we are going to be understanding the concept of risk assessment first, which will lead us nicely into risk assessment and care planning, and then talk about the impacts of risk assessment and how policies and procedures can uh, you know, affect the um, uh, integrated delivery of care, which is being given to the patient. And towards the end, we'll go in uh, and understand what are the dilemmas you can face or I can face as a social care worker or as a, as a person working within the health and social care sector, as a health and social care professional. Uh, sometimes when you're tasked with information to be shared or uh, you know news to be shared, or in some cases, some policies and procedures, when you implement them thoroughly, how can they pose you dilemmas in terms of, uh, you know, or create issues or probably, let's say when I say dilemmas, what I mean by that is create doubts uh, and issues um, in terms of you trying to deliver uh, a, the care to the patient as per a plan. But some of these, um, you know, implementation sometimes of these policies and procedures can create uh, up obstacles, hurdles, uh, issues, or doubts. And we'll be looking at a few with some examples to understand uh, them in a bit more detail and how to mitigate them uh, from a point of view of following the policies, but at the same time delivering um, you know, and providing the information without uh, doing any compromise or, um, you know, being in breach of any particular policy which is being implemented within the organization. 
Now, as always, uh, we will start off with some key terminology. Um, key terminology focuses on picking out some of the key uh, bits uh, of, uh, you know, words from the learning outcome and also, uh, you know, sets the foundation for us to get into understanding and reading this particular outcome and the assessment criteria. So the first one that we have come across, uh, you know, in this particular learning outcome is talking about, you know, risk assessment. Now, we looked at, I don't know if uh, most of you recall, in terms of the meaning of the word risk that we looked at yesterday, you know, it means that, you know, you're involving in a situation which can expose you to danger. That is the literal book dictionary meaning of the word risk. And when we talk about assessment, what we are basically looking at doing is we are looking at understanding what could be, um, you know, the actions that we would need to take in order to avoid those risks or situations that are going to put us in danger. Now, if we look at risk assessment as a whole, what, what we are basically discussing here is that we are going to be looking at a process through which we are going to identify risks and hazards which can appear in a workplace and can cause obstacles, can cause uh, injuries, or can dissuade people from following systems, processes, in order to deliver their uh, you know, service on a day-to-day -day basis. And a risk assessment typically is an important part because in the creation of a care plan for a patient, uh, generally risk assessment is done on various aspects of that care plan. And we will discuss that in a bit more detail, but just very briefly here, the concept of risk tends to be identifying risk and hazards which can lead to injury or slippages which can eventually cause, uh, you know, uh, life-threatening injuries or maybe life-changing uh, injuries to a patient when a patient is actually receiving care or is receiving some sort of treatment within, uh, you know, a particular set of hospital care room, whatever it is. Now, risk assessments that we typically do, um, you know, start off with a very basic thing. And a lot of us can quickly relate this to the fact that when you go into an office or a workplace, you generally ask to sign at the reception saying that you have signed into the register. Have you driven down? Who are you coming to meet? Your name and your credentials. And the reason why that is done is also related to uh, looking at some parts of it being a risk assessed. That because you are in that building, and you are under the jurisdiction of the employer or the organization that you're visiting. And if something is to happen in the event of fire, for example, if, if you know, if we have uh, the act of God, maybe an earthquake or things like that. And if the fire and fire brigade and fire ambulance services have to come in and identify everybody, then that visitor's book or the record register basically acts as a first point of contact to see how many people were in the building at the point of uh, time of the incident. And this is also, uh, you know, a key point, just as a very, very simple example that is used to do risk assessment. Now, that creates a record. It also helps to uh, identify uh, obviously, number of people in that building, if anything is to happen. And, you know, when you sign out, it shows that you have left the building securely and then you are no longer under the supervision of the organization. And in those cases, you know, it, it acts as the first point of contact of recording an entry that you 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 are recording the entry and exit of you coming in and meeting somebody and then leaving the organization or the building. So risk assessment gets start at that, um, you know, at the very basic point when you are even visiting an organization and that could be say an example of a visitor's book or a welcome book that you sign in order to ensure that uh, the organization is made aware of your presence until the time you are in the organization in the premises in the building it is the responsibility of the uh, organization to ensure your safety or your health and safety uh, and uh, if anything is to happen things like first aid uh, you know, and uh, other services need to be provided to you because you are within the jurisdiction of that organization. Now, when we look at risk assessment and when we look at care planning, how do we relate risk assessment to health and social care sector? Now, as uh, let's take a simple example that assume if you had a loved one or somebody who's very close to you, a near dear one, who's, un, uh, who's about to undergo some sort of a treatment in the hospital, it is very important for you specifically and also your, uh, you know, your relative, your near dear one who's undergoing, uh, who's going to be looking at uh, undergoing an operation or a procedure for them to be able to understand whether this is the right place for, for them to undergo the treatment or not. And in those cases, there is a certain amount of planning that would be done. And this planning, if we use the word care planning, 
would be required to be done to ensure that the treatment, the place, uh, the uh, after treatment, uh, you know, uh, therapy or after treatment support that the patient would receive would be conducive for the patient to go in and gives that patient the confidence that, okay, if I'm going to go in and I have this problem, I, when I come out, my, my problem or my issue would result. And that gives the patient mentally a lot of confidence and boost uh, and places a lot of trust in the people who are going to be delivering care. So when we look at risk assessment, creation of a care plan, for example, discussion with the clinical nurse, discussion uh, about the procedure with the doctor or the consultant before you undergo the operation, the leaflets or the additional information which is provided to you. And I'll give you an example here. For example, if somebody is to undergo, say, for example, some sort of an angioplasty, that means you're, you have a blockage in the heart and you have uh, been referred by your GP to a consultant, you go into the hospital and obviously you undergo some sort of a consultation first to understand how the process would be, what would be the procedure, what are the benefits of the procedure, what could be the drawbacks of that procedure, what are the risks involved in undergoing uh, an operation of that nature. All this discussion would be a part of your care plan. So when you go to the um, uh, GP and the GP refers you to an hospital, the NHS puts together this care plan for you as a patient to go through the whole process, understand what will happen, how it will happen, what are the time frames involved, who are the people who are going to be involved, what is the preparation that you need to do before the operation, what are the, uh, let's say, uh, bits and pieces in terms of information which are provided to you that would be required to be followed after your operation so that you can get back to your usual uh, you know, life and day-to-day -day operations that you do or for activities that you do, they will all be constituting a care plan. Now, during the creation of this care plan, there is a risk assessment will be done. Risk assessment in the case of that patient which is undergoing a heart operation would be things like they would be looking at taking bloods, they would be looking at taking, uh, you know, a blood test, which will be done to diagnose if the person has uh, or the patient has any underlying conditions like diabetes, uh, any other conditions which could be related to has that person undergone an operation before, has the angioplasty happened before, do they have any allergies, um, and in terms of what is the blood type, all these bits which are going to be discussed and filled up into some sort of a pre-operative form, which will be the information taken from the patient, would all be then used to primarily do risk assessment on whether the person is fit for this operation, are there other procedures which can be uh, you know, then discuss with the patient if the patient is vulnerable because of certain conditions, what could be the risk associated uh, with the surgery, and they will then be explained to the patient and the relatives of the patient, and this would be essentially uh, going hand in hand with what is called risk assessment and the creation of a care plan for the patient who's undergoing this heart operation. Obviously, the National Health Service and the hospital and the people who are involved will need to be looking at compliances. And, uh, you know, there will be some information which is normally provided to the patient on the quality of care, how the care is going to be delivered, what are the various compliances. If a stinting needs to be done in the heart to remove a blockage, then what is the, uh, you know, recommended uh, let's say, stint which will be put in and uh, has it been approved, uh, you know, um, under the uh, regulation, all these things will fall under compliances. And then funding for the care, obviously, in the case of uh, the NHS, the funding is going to be, you know, through the National Health Service, the patient would not be required to pay anything or pay for the services, apart from, you know, if you're, um, say, for example, paying for your prescription, things like that. But yes, all this is going to be discussed and the main component of gathering information uh, from the patient about the patient itself and about the condition of, uh, you know, the, um, le let's say the condition of the patient are all going to be done, noted down into a patient information form. And this is then going to be used to do risk assessment to see whether the patient is okay uh, and, you know, can, un can undergo this operative procedure. If that is not possible because of risk to life, then these risks would be explained to the patient and the family. And there would be other procedures, if there are options available, would also be discussed. And all this will be classed as part of what is called risk assessment and care planning. So as you can see, although this particular term risk and risk assessment does apply universally to mostly all sectors, but in the case of health and social care, in the case of, uh, you know, when we talk about 
um, you know, National Health Service NHS, risk assessment is going to be contextualized to the risks which the patient faces or can face uh, because of the operative surgery the patient in this case would undergo. And this is also quite important because there are various policies and procedures which are going to be followed. Uh, the information which is provided by the consultant, by the GP, by the clinical nurse, or the practice nurse, which is going to be essentially involved in, in the care plan when you have had the surgery, and the staff in terms of healthcare uh, workers and social care workers, which will be involved in ensuring that you're back on your feet and you're doing your day-to-day -day activities, will all be following certain policies and procedures, and they will be related to your health and safety to ensure that you're back on your feet as quickly as possible in the circumstances uh, given and with medication and other things that you are going to take. And hopefully this will bring you back um, in terms of, you know, you going back to your day-to-day -day activities. So it is a very important concept. It is something that we need to understand. There is a bit of theory that we will go into. And what we will do is just look at a short video, which is to give you an idea in terms of how risk assessment is essentially done. And, you know, from a, from a point of view of the health and social care setting, and that is where this video would come in uh, handy. So let's have a listen in. Uh, and look into this video for about a couple of minutes. Um, there are two which I'm going to play. One is a generic one, uh, which basically talks about a risk assessment in health and social care. And then I'll show you an actual video of a care room in which, you know, how risk assessment is done and why it is important that these risk assessments are done on a regular basis in order to ensure that any risks which are encountered can be mitigated, plans can be put in place to reduce those risks and because of the reduction of those risks, the risk to injuries and hazards which, uh, you know, uh, clients can face or patients can face are reduced. And that is why it is very important as a concept that the implementation of health and safety policies and policies related to making sure patients are safe, uh, you know, people are safe, customer service, uh, you know, they receive uh, the, the, the care which is required. Um, in, in a particular setting and, and can receive it confidently and, uh, you know, have that faith and confident in terms that, yes, I'm going to be receiving care, which is I'm in good hands and I'm going to be, you know, obviously getting well soon or, you know, uh, getting rid of the problem that I've come in to get, uh, uh, get it operated. So let's see this particular video. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, this particular video basically shows us uh, details of, you know, how uh, risk assessment is done within a particular setup, uh, you know, in health and social care. Now, let's look at another video which basically shows this in implementation. So let me play that and then share the screen. Care homes should present a safe environment for staff, residents and visitors. But good standards of health and safety do not just happen on their own. Safe systems of work have to be implemented. Staff have to be trained. Machinery and equipment have to be maintained in good working order. In other words, 
Health and safety has to be managed, as with any other part of the business. Paying attention to health and safety is not only a legal requirement, it also makes good economic sense. Losing valuable staff through preventable injuries such as a fall on a slippery floor or back pain caused by poor lifting techniques costs the care industry millions of pounds every year. Risk assessments identify the risks to the health and safety of staff, residents and visitors and examine the best methods of eliminating or reducing those risks. In many cases, How do I to control the risk can be obvious and easy to implement. Trivial hazards can usually be ignored, as can hazards with an extremely low likelihood of occurring. Some assessments may be simple and arise directly from observation, for example, if the lift door closes too quickly. Others may be more complex and could include things like staff training needs, type of equipment, how it's used and by whom, or building alterations to meet the needs of residents. The cooperation of all members of staff is important in the process of risk assessment. All staff must constantly be aware of potential hazards, which must be reported and controls implemented to reduce their risk. There are five steps to risk assessment. Step one, identify the hazards. Step two, identify who is at risk. Step three, evaluate the risks. Step four, record your findings. And step five, review and revise the assessments. Step one, identify the hazards. The meaning of the term hazard is something with the potential to cause harm. This can include articles, substances, machines, methods of working, the working environment and other aspects of work. The best way to identify hazards in your care home is to walk around the home and look for them. This may be achieved by either observation or consultation and the best system will contain elements of both. Observation. Watch people at work and look for situations which could be potentially dangerous. Working practices often differ considerably from official procedures, so discrete observation may be required. Don't forget to take into account all non-routine operations such as maintenance, deliveries and emergency arrangements. Consultation. So as you can see in this case as well, um, you know, th obviously this was a video which I've clipped because like they video. they are going to be looking at obviously, um, you know, going through the process of uh, whole process of you know, doing risk assessment and basically the four steps which are involved are going to be discussed. But generally the idea was to try and showcase that, you know, when we talk about um, the process of risk assessment, what is involved and obviously from uh, our perspective we are looking at um, you know seeing this being implemented within a care home uh, to get an idea and to get a perspective that you know why it is very important so examples of the lift door not closing for example is is a case in point wherein sometimes even to you know when, when we are providing services and there's disabled access and the access is provided through lift uh, for patient or customers in those cases you know these points have to be looked into or taken into consideration and these will all be involved in the process of what is called risk assessment now with this background in mind let's go into some of the assessment criteria and what we're going to do is basically address some of these points by discussing more information which is given in the indicative content uh, in terms of what are risk assessments what do we need to cover and how do they relate to things in terms of you know the legislations that we discussed yesterday now the first one talks about uh, basically if i do away with the jargon in terms of command verb it says how information from risk assessment informs care planning for individuals and organizational decision making so here what we want to be looking at is when risk assessment as a process is carried out and as a uh, you know is carried out within a setup or an organization how does it inform uh, relevant individuals which means care workers nurses doctors gps practice managers how does it give them information 
about what kind of care uh, or what type of care actually needs to be provided to the individual who's coming to receive that care in the care home or in the hospital. And how does that particular uh, information, which is gathered from risk assessment processes within the organization, help in decision making or making the right decisions essentially to ensure that the uh, the setup or the facility is geared to provide these, uh, uh, you know, provide these, uh, let's say, um, uh, basic amenities which are required to be able to give out care or, you know, for the patient to receive care. Now, risk assessments are primarily done because some point in time what we also need to do is document them to create records that okay these comply for the reasons of compliances so if i may put it this way that sometimes some of these things have to be done primarily to ensure that we have got documentation and we are meeting compliances which have been set by bodies like cqc uh, which which ensure that quality and standards do not slip within some of these organizations and care uh, or setups as care homes as we would know um, in terms of delivering care to the patient. So a risk assessment is a written record. It gives you what was the time and date on which the risks were assessed and you know what kind of um, risks actually or potential hazards essentially were there at that point in time. And to basically look at mitigating these risks, what were the steps taken or decided that they will be taken by the management in order to do away with those risks. Now, risk assessments is a, is a legal requirement under the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulation 1999, which we discuss MHSR. And this is primarily to be done in all organizations delivering care to patients regularly and in most cases it is done on an annual basis whether it's for equipment infrastructure facilities uh, even personnel and to, to a certain extent things like you have to undergo certain trainings which ensure that you are having the skills and the knowledge to be able to operate though the equipment and you know provide care uh, to the level of or level of the standards which have been dis, uh, dis, uh, you know designed within the organization now, the information which is collected from risk assessment is essentially useful at two, in, in, two, in many locations, but obviously for the context of this particular assessment criteria, we're looking at two important points. One is how is this information going to be uh, useful for creating a care plan or providing individualized care to a patient within the setup? And the second thing would be how would this information from the risk assessment which has been done or has been carried out would be useful for the management or, for example, the registered manager in a care home or the practice manager to be able to make long term decisions to ensure that these risks are never uh, are not faced again in the near future and they do not pose any risk of injury to the patient or staff or workers working within the setup. Now, when you review, and uh, there are lots of different types of risk assessment formats, but depending on the policy, um, you know, and the, say, for example, um, the, the health and safety policy, which is, which is implemented within the organization, you would generally see that these risk assessment uh, plans, uh, are, are risk assessment as a process is, is normally done using the health and safety executive, you know, template, which is provided. And they, these could be customized, contextualized to, you know, the requirements of the organization. And in those cases, you know, when it is contextualized, it is basically meeting the requirements which have been specified in the policy within the organization. So if I just share with you very briefly a template in terms of how risk assessment is done, and this is a particular template which is also going to be available on Moodle. And obviously, uh, the idea there is to understand how risk assessment is done. So this is a standard template which has been downloaded from the hsc.gov.uk website. And as you can see, this talks about how risk assessment can be done by somebody who is a qualified uh, you know, health and safety officer within the organization, and they would then go about doing the risk assessment on various different aspects in terms of departments within the organization. So things like company name, you know, data of review, uh, assessment was carried out by which person and on what date it was carried out, what are the hazards which are, you know, have been detected or have been discovered, uh, what kind of harm these hazards could cause or where, you know, how they could potentially cause a harm or injury to patient, customers, 
you know, visitors or staff within the organization, what kind of risks can they pose, how these risks can be controlled, and then obviously looking at uh, what kind of actions or corrective action has to be put into place to ensure that these risks uh, do not cause any injury, who is the action going to be carried by, or, you know, who's going to be responsible for actually, uh, you know, carrying out this action, and then when this would be completed by what date. And this tends to be, you know, the um, <clears throat> a simple template. And this, obviously, as you as you fill in, can be expanded to cover all the details, uh, which could be within a care home, within a hospital, within a GP surgery. You know, depending on uh, where it is being carried out, it can be used and obviously uh, then reviewed by the management or the health and safety officer to ensure that you know the risks that have been discovered, there is a plan which has been put in place uh, to mitigate or remove those risks. If I show you a working template, uh, just as an example, again, this will be upon Moodle. This is a risk assessment template, essentially, which has been uh, you know, slightly modified, but as you can see, the main headings do remain the same. Um, there are some guidance notes which are also provided so that you are aware that what kind of risks you're going to be assessing uh, and what kind of uh, checklist that you will go by to do the risk assessment. And that has been clar uh, clearly given here. And this is a much more uh, suitable uh, template which could be put into action uh, because you're looking at risk assessment from a point of view of employees, staff. You're looking at risk assessment from a point of view of visitors, workers who may be providing the care. And then also you're looking at things uh, in terms of what kind of activities can, um, uh, you know, which are done within the setup can actually create if if it can, if it does create any risks or, you know, poses any hazards, what uh, these hazards and risks could be. And you are basically listing them down and, you know, going through this five step, uh, step process of doing basically risk assessment. Now, when we talk about um, obviously uh, doing this risk assessment, what we are looking at is that at some stage when the risk assessment is done, the data which comes out of this risk assessment would clearly identify uh, or give you action points to be able to do. So one, it will give you the risks, what kind of uh, activities actually, or what kind of uh, risks are present, whether it's risk from equipment, risk from infrastructure, risk from uh, not following the standards. It could be risks from, uh, say, for example, shortage or scarcity of certain resources within the organization. And then what steps have to be put into place in order to ensure that these risks are minimized. And they will come across from step four or five. And that is where you know risk assessment or risk assessment analysis would definitely be helpful. Now, Let's look at an example of how uh, you know risk assessment actually works. So a basic example that I've taken in place is that fire is always a hazard in a workplace. So that is where uh, that is why you normally see designated areas which are created in and around public buildings and obviously offices where people can go and have uh, a bit of smoke. So for example, if you if if people smoke, then there are designated areas which are created wherein they need to be present and they are normally outside or certain distance away from the main premises in order to avoid any potential risks which could come out of, uh, you know, uh, which could be created because of fire. Now, sometimes you could also have these risks which could be associated with equipment which is either damaged or has not been serviced properly. And in those cases, you know, they can also cause fire or hazard, uh, one of the hazards which could be, uh, you know, uh, can lead to a bit of a cause of uh, risk or injury would be fire which could originate because of the equipment not working properly and or <clears throat> say for example in some cases not being serviced and leads to a fault and it uh, then obviously sparks or short circuits and creates a fire in the premises now in order to look at ensuring that health and safety and policy is implemented and ensure that everybody is safe within the organization, some organizations do you know clearly display a policy which which basically says they have a non-smoking policy uh, within the building. So if you need to smoke, you need to go outside. There is no, uh, you know, uh, as per law, there is um, there is a restriction on in terms of you know smoking within the building. Sometimes you would see that there are checklists which are or, you know, safety checklists which are installed next to certain equipment which staff can use 
So if you look at care homes, nurseries, you know, basically sometimes where you have child minders who are primarily involved in the laundrette and obviously in terms of, uh, you know, operating washing machines, double dryers, and they generally take care of the laundry in a nursery, in a children's nursery, you would see that there are certain checklists which are installed to ensure that workers are aware that uh, you should not have wet hands or uh, water should not be dispensed there, or in some cases, uh, there should be proper ventilation in order to ensure that there is uh, the appliances don't heat up. And these are basic checklists. So if the equipment is not being used, you need to switch it off. Um, if in the event the equipment is not working or stops working, please call a qualified electrician or notify the authorities or the relevant manager on that duty manager on that day. And these are basically checklists which are in, uh, installed or you know displayed in order to ensure that uh, you know proper policies and procedures are followed. So workers are given instructions in terms of understanding if these things do not work. This is the next step of the process that you need to do. You need to call the duty manager and they would then be looking into this particular fault. And this bit in terms of the process, one, what happens next, what happens next, what happens next is primarily the process through which you go and you look at, uh, you know, then creating policies which will basically be acting as guidance for workers, staff, people working within the organization to understand that if this does not work as planned, this is what needs to be done. If it, this does not work, then I need to contact this person. And it gives them a kind of a book to go by to understand what things have to be, how things have to be, uh, you know, uh, how things would work and obviously how, who they need to sensitize or call in the case of an emergency or if uh, such a situation would arise. And this process that we follow tends to be a four-step process. And they, uh, this process is uh, to understand it theoretically, you know, uh, what we need to be able to do is understand the uh, three distinctive stages um, uh, which basically we need to go through in order to identify the risks. So risks tend to be essentially, you know, uh, areas which will which can pose a, or cause a problem in the future. And this could be because of equipment, infrastructure, resources, less scarce resources or lapses uh, or human error. And they have to be identified during the risk assessment plan. Now, in order to deal with risk, what we need to look at is go through this process to understand, you know, uh, how do we work? Um, how do we look at this process of risk assessment and what is the outcome of that? So first of all, we need to understand the person's circumstances. We need to be able to then identify the risks which the person is facing. We need to assess those risks and the impact of those risks, uh, and the likelihood of the impact of those risks on the patient. Uh, receiving the care and then finally look at how do we manage this risk and when I say manage this risk this is where the organizational decision making comes into play because when the risk assessment template is looked at and all the information is gathered it will straight away give you what are the risks who can be harmed from these risks it will also tell you what is to be done or what we are already doing to mitigate these risks if there are further actions which are necessary then the consultant or the competent person uh, would basically identify what actions could be necessarily taken to reduce further these risks and who will put these actions into place and by what date. And this would be the organizational decision making that needs to be done in order to essentially, uh, uh, you know, analyze and assess the uh, risk associated when uh, a care is being provided or care planning essentially is being done uh, to be provided to the patients or any any particular customer client who's going to be receiving care in a particular setup. So I hope this first particular assessment criteria is clear wherein we need to understand what is risk assessment? Why is it important as per legislation? Um, what, what are the various uh, ways through which risk assessment can be done so we can make use of a template. And then once these are, uh, once the uh, risk assessment is done and we have captured the information, how this can be used by the organization to look at, uh, by the management in the organization to look at decision-making from a long-term perspective, short to long-term perspective. And from a point of view of health and social care worker, when we are looking at putting together a care plan you know, for a patient, and this would then come in quite handy. Now, in the second assessment criteria, we are basically looking at understanding the impact of, uh, you know, health and safety policy within a particular setup. 
So here, if we assume that we have created a care plan and we now are looking at implementing that care plan for a patient within the setup and the patient has got admitted. So if you imagine a situation where essentially what will happen is that um, I gave an example earlier that a person uh, or a patient is going to be undergoing heart surgery after the initial consultation and everything. Um, uh, the patient has decided to go ahead. They have spoken about in detail uh, the procedure, the process, uh, the post-operative surgery process, how the recovery phase will be led. And everything has been discussed with the doctor, the consultant, and the nurse. And the patient has said, yes, that I want to undergo the surgery. And in this case, now what will happen is we need to look at how the patient will undergo this particular surgery and what are the policies which would be implemented in order to ensure that the patient receives the due care and is able to then uh, you know, come back out of it uh, successfully and, you know, beat, say, for example, the reasons why they had gone into this care uh, in the first instance. So when we talk about the impact of health and safety policy, what we are looking at here would be, um, you know, the main regulation of health and safety uh, work regulation, MHSR of 1999, which we discussed which requires obviously all employers, you know, all staff employees working within a setup to carry out risk assessments and to ensure that they are able to eliminate or minimize risks to health and safety of the patient. So when we when we talk about, uh, you know, the use uh, of say personal and protective equipment, PPE, this particular bit is used, uh, you know, to primarily minimize the risk to health and safety for the individuals who are actually providing the care. So if I give you an example of why PPE became very important during the COVID pandemic is because of the fact that a lot of people who were, uh, when I say a lot of people, I mean a lot of healthcare workers, social workers, uh, you know, technic physicians, nurses, people who were involved in pro primarily providing care uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in hospitals to patients in the ICU also ended up contracting COVID and there were a lot of fatalities in terms of loss of life. And PPE, uh, you know, was later then made available in abundant quantities to ensure that anybody who is providing care to a COVID-19 um, uh, you know, COVID-affected patient, then in those cases, the personal protective made the difference in terms of ensuring that the health and safety of the worker providing care, uh, you know, whether it's the janitor, whether it's the nurse, health and social care worker, anybody who is basically providing care to the patient during uh, their recovery phase was not infected and was kept safe because of the use of uh, personal and protective equipment or PPE. Now, when we talk about some of these aspects in terms of how health and safety policy uh, impacts, uh, you know, the working or day-to-day -day working of staff within the organization, we need to be able to look at, um, you know, understanding why this is important. And from a legislation point of view, what are the various legislations which come into play, which basically ensure that uh, employers are ensuring that the implementation of the health and safety policy is done in a way wherein it protects staff, employees, workers, and also its customers, when I say patients, essentially, who are receiving care. Now, if we look at some of the policies which will be directly related to this assessment criteria, we're going to be looking at the health and safety work regulation. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences regulation, RIDOR as we call it. And we are also going to be looking at the control of substances hazardous, hazardous to, you know, health regulation or COSH, which are basically going to be directly related to this assessment criteria because here these would be used and have to be implemented, followed by any um, you know setup within the na uh, national health service or a care uh, you know provider to minimize the risk to health and safety uh, from the use of either any hazardous substances, nanomaterial, or uh, in in terms of ensuring that all the equipment infrastructure is safe for the workers to be able to work and deliver this uh, quality of care uh, as per the guidelines set by CQC to patients who are coming in to receive care within the care home or the hospital. Now, in order to look at this particular assessment criteria, let's look at a bit of a case. Now, this is an actual case um, um, which, which I have put forward. And this actual case basically looks at uh, two things. So I've uh, anonymized the name. So what the case talks about is that if you're a care worker and a care assistant who is basically going uh, to meet one of your clients or one of your patients who's receiving care at home, 
and that person have called K. So if I look at uh, the K who is the care assistant who basically goes to the client, uh, which is Mr. W. And uh, when she reaches obviously the house, she finds that the house is in very poor condition. Uh, Mr. W has a, has, a, has a pet and obviously there is, she has read into the file of the patient and she knows that the patient has a history of psychiatric illness and in the past has been admitted to the hospital under the Mental Act uh, of 1983. Now when Kay arrives into the house, she finds that the house is in very poor condition. The garden is overgrown. Uh, there is a lot of rubbish and old furniture in the house. The front door of the house is open and she also sees that there are some of the floorboards in the house are missing and obviously uh, you know there is a possibility that if somebody is to walk through the floor the person could drop into the cellar and this poses health and safety hazard not just for the client uh, which is Mr. W but also you know for the pet and if anybody is visiting she is visiting as a care assistant to see the person uh, also will face you know health and safety hazards. Now, what she needs to do in this case, so looking at the three regulations, which is primarily, uh, you know, um, uh, looking at, say, uh, the work and, uh, you know, health, so work, safety and welfare regulation of 1999, here what she has to do is basically alert the relevant authorities in terms of the conditions, quality conditions which are there in the house the house maybe or the accommodation not being fit for purpose and which could pose a threat or danger essentially in this case uh, and uh, to the health and safety of the individual because the individual could slip, trip or fall and that could lead to further injuries to the patient which is Mr. W. Now the second bit that she has to look at is she has to look at ensuring that uh, there is no risk of injuries from diseases and dangerous occurrences. So she has to also inform relevant authorities that the uh, the, uh, the patient has a dog and that she they would come in and weigh up the possibilities of any infection which could happen through the pet. And in this case, what are the risks involved for Mr. K? So this would be the second regulation that we will need to look at from a health and safety policy perspective that she would need to you know, follow uh, and sensitize relevant people to ensure that the client or the patient in this case is uh, kept safe. And the last would be to look at you know, hazardous substances, which could be a threat to the patient essentially um, it, itself. And these could be because of the, you know, nature when she comes in and discovers that there is rubbish and old furniture, and, you know, obviously the property is in, in a bad condition, that this could be, that this could create deteriorating, you know, circumstances when the, wherein, for example, damp or other things could be considered under what are called you know, dangerous substances, which could also pose a risk to the uh, health of the client, which is Mr. W. So when these risks are identified, she would then need to look at uh, implementing or uh, first of all, notifying relevant authorities, maybe a manager and relevant people within the, uh, the people, uh, within the setup of domiciliary care, which are providing the care to the patient at their house. Uh, to ensure that they are they are able to come in and do relevant checks and ensure that there are no uh, there is proper implementation in terms of you know obviously the uh, health and safety standards there is no risk which is posed from uh, 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 you know say for example from the property in terms of causing any injury and the third would be to look at any hazardous or substances which could basically you know pose risk or cause further inspection either through the pet or the property itself because it's in a dilapidated state or in a squally condition and that could affect the health of the uh, you know the patient so in this case, as you can see, if she's able to pick these three points up and see the implementation of these three policies, this would have a positive impact on how domiciliary care can be provided to Mr. W, which is the client. And in this case, it reduces, it identifies the risks with the assessment she has done and uh, by informing relevant authorities or people within our organization which are able to then come and do the further assessment of the risk and then put a and mitigate when i say uh, they are able to negate or mitigate these risks which can pose uh, risks in terms of health and also in terms of safety to the patient who's receiving this care at home and this is how you would generally be looking at 
implementation of some of the health and safety policies and the standards and the acts and the legislation which have been put in place to ensure that the uh, the nature of the care and the kind of care is provided which is provided is meeting the quality standards as set by cqc so i hope this particular assessment criteria is clear we have to look at uh, picking out uh, some relevant policies from the ones that we've discussed in learning outcome one take a actual example to do some analysis and talk about how this uh, is then put into practice and what policies and regulations are followed in order to ensure that risks are minimized and uh, you know risks to health and safety of the individual is minimized who's receiving the uh, care let's quickly go across to the assessment criteria 2.3 here we are looking at discussing dilemmas which could be encountered in relating to uh, in relation to implementing systems and policies. So again, here, what I would do is basically uh, talk about, um, you know, through one or two examples to discuss what could be the dilemmas social care workers actually face or people within the sector actually face when they are providing care to the patient. So when you look at health and safety policies, um, you know, within an organization, uh, they would sometimes pose, you know, issues or create issues or uh, you know, doubts, essentially, if I use another word uh, or a synonym for dilemmas, uh, when the care is being provided. Now, there are different kinds of dilemmas which can come in, and obviously some of these could be related to resources, it could be risk uh, related to the individual and, and others in some cases, it could be different priorities which are set by the stakeholders. Uh, in terms of your manager, the care worker himself, the patient himself, and sometimes changes in legislation can also mean that these, uh, the, you know, they, they could pose different doubts or create doubts or issues and uh, dilemmas essentially when the service is being, uh, you know, provided. And sometimes you would also look at certain acts and legislations like Human Rights Act, and you look at the person-centered approach, safety regulations, which could also be posing dilemmas when uh, you know they have to be implemented to the core to ensure there are risks there are no risks for the patient or the staff or the workers providing the care now if i look at talking uh, about this particular criteria using an example one such example could be that i have put out is that say for example we are dealing with a patient who has lost the mental capacity to make decisions and in this case this would be deprivation of liberty uh, safeguards so when we look at the uh, this particular option uh, this particular option this would mean that under the law somebody who has become incapacitated to be able to make decisions then under this law deprivation of liber uh, liberty is safeguards uh, wherever it is necessary we can deprive the you know the client or the resident or the patient who lacks the capability to consent uh, for their own care and treatment in order to ensure that they are safe from harm. So they cannot do self-harm and they are also safe from harm. So in those cases, you know, we will put this into place and when this has to be put into use and into practice, you would see there'll be a dilemma which comes in wherein how do we look at assessing the patient is mentally incapacitated, does not have the capability to be able to make decisions. And when this legislation has to be uh, put into practice, you know, there is a dilemma which could which could arise in the minds of, uh, you know, the social care workers or in the minds of the relatives uh, that, uh, you know, this 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 would mean that, you know, they would be faced with a decision that they are not willing to take. And in such cases, this would be a dilemma. Now, sometimes you would see that this particular legislation can be overridden by the Human Rights Act of 1998. So, for example, if the person tries to explain uh, and uh, go through the explanation of the state, uh, you know, situation with the patient or the relatives of the patient, and they override, they say, yes, we are in agreement, we are in sync, then this deprivation of liberty safeguards can be overridden by Human Rights Act. And in this case, you know, this can pose a risk or maybe create a dilemma for how the treatment has to be given to the patient. So when you look at high risk uh, situations, sometimes, you know, this uh, has to be taken into account and obviously uh, in the, uh, you know, for the, for the, uh, you know, benefit of the patient, you know, um, what has to happen is that um, the care has to, the decision has to be taken 
And in those cases, what you will look at is that sometimes healthcare workers, social workers, uh, or, you know, people involved in providing care, uh, clinicians and nurses and doctors have to make these tough decisions um, uh, in terms of ensuring that the patient is pulled out of the harm's way or is not able to self-harm and in some cases receive treatment which is required uh, for the patient to get better. Let's look at another instance. So, for example, if you have, uh, you know, let's say, if 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 you are a social care worker and you visit the home and you normally go and obviously provide certain care, domiciliary care to the patient at home, and one fine day you go and visit your uh, you know patient and you find the patient is not there, the patient is not there in the house, and you start making some inquiries, you basically call a few people or check with the neighbors or maybe the relatives, and you are still not able to find the whereabouts of the person. So in those cases, one of the dilemmas that you would face is should you report and call uh, your manager, should you call the police to uh, report that the person has gone missing and provide all the information. Now, these are dilemmas that, you know, social care workers could face when they are trying to implement, you know, system and policies uh, in, in, try, in, in the process of adhering to delivering care to patients. Now, when we look at, um, obviously, certain acts and legislation, so when we look at the CARE Act, what we do see that there is a legal safeguard, uh, which is the obligation, you know, in this act that we have to, uh, you know, safeguard the patients by making sure that they are in a safe building, they are in a safe location, and they, they, the, the situation that they are in does not cause them any harm or danger to life. Now, if anything is to happen, which is something which is not uh, within your control, then you have to inform relevant authorities. Uh, you know, when I say relevant authorities, well, relevant people who manage health and safety and uh, standards for that to be able to ensure that they are able to come in and take action in time so that a life could be saved or, you know, certain risks which the patient can face because of the actions being taken are mitigated and that would mean uh, saving a life. So some of these are, you know, examples of dilemmas that health and social workers might face when they're trying to implement system and policies as described or as given in their employment contract or by the organization. And these could be, uh, you know, creating sometimes doubts, issues, and uh, pose dilemmas primarily for the purposes of implementation. Now, a quick other example that I would put forward just to, you know, bring home this point is when you are looking at one of the acts, Data Protection Act, you know, of 2018 now, when you look at the Data Protection Act, uh, sometimes what happens is if you are a care worker or if you are somebody who's involved directly with the patient in terms of delivering that care and you are privy to certain information and this information has to be then shared uh, or is being seeked by members of the family or you know relatives of the patient, how much information can be shared, whether this is the right time to share that information, whether you can disclose all the information you know, and with keeping in line uh, with the Data Protection Act uh, and obviously privacy part of it, uh, you know, which the patient is, uh, you know, let's say um, when we look at the person-centered approach, privacy, uh, you know, and, and information is uh, something that can only be disclosed in under certain circumstances. Again, when, when we look at following the policy and procedure, this would mean that you can disclose this information to the family or family member. But in some cases, you know, this would be detrimental to the patient because they would not be comfortable in that information being shared with their uh, with other members of the staff or, for example, their family. And this would then pose a dilemma, essentially, to the health and social care worker uh, in terms of what is to be done. So there are scenarios in which sometimes you would see these situations arise. But obviously, uh, when policies and procedures are implemented, they can sometimes pose uh, dilemmas to uh, people who are actually giving out this care or are responsible for del uh, delivery of this care to the patients. Now, the last assessment criteria in this particular learning outcome talks about the effect of non-compliance. So essentially, when we talk about the effect of non-compliance, that means if policies and procedures are not followed, laws and legislations which have been laid down to be followed within the health and social care sector, things like the CARE Act, the Health and Safety Act, we talk about the NHS Act. Uh, there are lots of these legislations that we discussed yesterday, which are the Mental Health Act, uh, the CARE Standards Act, the, Child, uh, the Children Act, the Disability and Inequality Act, 
And if these standards are not followed, then it creates non-compliance. And non-compliance with these acts can pose serious threats under health and safety uh, in terms of services being delivered uh, within a particular health and social care setup. Now, these non-compliances obviously can pose risks and also lead to uh, termination of services, can also lead to cancellation of licenses for care homes or any such organization or setup which is delivering care. And in some cases, it can also lead to criminal offenses uh, and criminal offenses being booked against the member. Uh, when I say members, I mean the staff and personnel which are provided, uh, you know, are responsible for providing this care within the care setup. Now, when we look at these compliances, uh, non-compliances, essentially, you would generally see that the inspection organizations like CQC, uh, NIHR, and I see they would primarily be issuing non-compliance uh, related documentation first. So for example, some of these workplaces will undergo uh, routine inspections. And if there is a non-compliance which has been discovered or detected that this policy or there is this is this is a lapse which is happening in the implementation of this particular policy within the organization. Generally, the organizations and the individuals responsible for carrying out those duties are given, uh, you know, enough notice or warnings, as I would say, uh, if, if they are uh, leading to non-compliance uh, with regards to the following up and implementation of that policy or procedure within the organization. Now, if these are leading to serious consequences or can lead to serious consequences like injury, loss of life, uh, or you know, life-threatening injuries, then in those cases, even li sometimes licenses after giving warning and giving a particular amount of time to be able to course correct that particular, uh, say, for example, the problem, if after that they have not been complied with, then the termination of licenses uh, or services can be done and by the CQC or the uh, you know or the or the standard bodies to ensure that lives are not put at risk and uh, the the quality of care does not slip for the patient which are receiving this care. Now, in severe circumstances, if there is continued violation of this in terms of non-compliance and laws and legislation are not followed, then it can also lead to serious consequences in terms of imprisonment, fines and financial fines and leading to the cancellation of, you know, license or even imprisonment uh, under certain acts and legislations within the care sector. Now, one of the other quick things which I would want to point out is that sometimes um, there is room, um, and I, when, I, when I put it this way, let me rephrase that, there are, you know, um, let's say procedures in place within organization wherein people can report if the non-compliance is going unnoticed, if the manager or the management is not willing to rectify the non-compliance or the, if they are not willing to cooperate with the staff in order to ensure that these slippages uh, in, in quality of care or lack of resources are not dealt with. And sometimes in the organizations, you will see what is also present is what is called a whistleblowing policy. Now, whistleblowing policy tends to be when you essentially, uh, you know, uh, stay and you're a part and parcel of the organization, you, you basically then, you know, act as a whistleblower. That means you, in the goodwill, in the goodwill, you know, under this particular Employment Right Act 1996 uh, and Public Interest Disclosure Act of 1998, you are basically, uh, you know, you become, you are let's say a worker within an organization and you have the right as a worker to take this case up because what you are seeing is that you are uh, seeing continuous slippages of uh, policies not being followed or standards being breached and in this case you feel that this would put risk uh, would this would pose a serious risk to the patients receiving care or people receiving care within the particular setup. And what you decide to do is rather than stay uh, quiet and observe, what you do is you basically report it to relevant authorities so that, uh, you know, course correction can be done or, you know, uh, inspections can be done to ensure that the requirements are met. And in this case, what you would generally see that the person would follow some sort of a process wherein the person would identify the issue why is it occurring? And then document those uh, issues with some facts and then basically provide it to relevant authorities as a whistleblower to say 
that okay these are things which i've noticed i've discussed it with the manager but obviously there is no action being taken by the management and this is where i've decided now to go public or basically make this aware to relevant authorities because this is posing a serious risk under health and safety uh, for uh, one uh, for people delivering the care and second for patients who are receiving the care within a health and social care setup so you can make a call you can submit a you know a disclosure and you can do so confidentially uh, confidentially this is where your identity is protected so that the employer can not go after you and this is sometimes covered under what is called the whistle blowing policy within an organization so there are different ways through which non compliance can affect the working of a setup or a care home uh, or uh, you know health and social care setup and obviously non compliance can lead to um, um, non compliance of these policies can effectively lead to cancellation of licenses imprisonment uh, and in some cases you know warnings it starts off with warning uh, in order for the uh, you know organization to course correct uh, that particular um, a shortcoming if warnings are not issued then services could be limited funding could be withdrawn in this sector and in some cases uh, cancellation of licenses uh, can also happen and if there are serious breaches fines can be imposed first and then cancellation of licenses and finally can lead to impr imprisonment as well so these are some of the impacts of non compliance of health and safety regulation within the health and social care sector if the policies are not met care cannot and care services cannot be provided to the standards and if these are not provided they are basically posing a risk uh, a serious risk or a risk uh, in terms of harm can lead to harm uh, or various types of illnesses um, and even uh, you know um, let's say um, pose uh, life threatening you know life uh, changing threats to the patient who are receiving service or care within the setup and this can have legal ramifications in terms of uh, warnings first if warnings do not heed then obviously uh, suspension of services suspension of funding it could lead to cancellation of license and even criminal charges and imprisonment against the management if they fail to act and to ensure that non compliances uh, you know or, or compliances with the health and safety regulation are not done and implemented within the setup so any questions at this stage happy to take and uh, you know um, a copy of this recording and the presentation with some handouts including the risk assessment template and uh, one or two articles for additional reading uh, would be available on moodle and that would be giving you more insight into what we've discussed today with regards to uh, understanding the ways in with health and safety requirements impact on customers and on work practitioners specifically within the health and social care setup okay good stuff so any questions at your end